All right, awesome. Okay, um, hello everyone on the other side. Uh, welcome to our online quantum chaos seminars. Thank you once again for, for joining us, for attending. Um, today we have a, a very exciting All right, uh, awesome. talk. Sorry, I'm okay. myself. Um, this happens. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just, you know, as, as usual, I'd like to remind you that, uh, of course, you'll be uh, seeing the presentation here in the YouTube channel, but we encourage you to interact with us and with the speaker through the live chat um, and just post questions and, and comments and, and we'll just pick it up uh, from there and, and ask them to the speaker. Um, all right, so today uh, it's really our pleasure to welcome Professor Lia Santos from Tishu University. Uh, Lia is a world leading expert in the study of non equilibrium quantum dynamics, thermalization, quantum chaos. Um, Lia did her PhD at the University of Sao Paulo and was uh, then did postdoctoral work in uh, Yale University, uh, Michigan State, and Dartmouth College. And she is currently a professor of physics at uh, Sheshiga University. And um, yeah, so again, uh, we are very excited, Leah, to have you here. Thank you for joining us. And whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Okay, so first I'd like to thank Pablo and Peter for this invitation and uh, you all for showing up. Um, many of the results that I'll show to you today were obtained with previous postdocs, Jonathan, Marco, and Mauro. Jonathan is now one of my main collaborators and I also had help from other collaborators and you see their names uh, showing up um, in the next slide. So since this is a sequence of seminars about quantum chaos, I'm going to start discussing indicators of quantum chaos, the several existing and proposed indicators of quantum chaos. And then also together with that, I'm going to discuss this topic, uh, non-equilibrium quantum dynamics, which is one of the main topics I'm interested in now. No? So what are the time scales involved in the relaxation process of isolated many body quantum systems? What are the different behaviors, the different self averages that we find at different times and for different quantities? So I think the, this talk will be more of a lecture than a real detailed analysis of um, new results. Yeah? Very well. So let's start with indicators of chaos. Let's start with level statistics. Uh, the most uh, popular indicator of chaos is uh, level space and distribution. No? So the distribution of space in between neighboring levels. So pick the, all the spacings, E2 minus E1, E3 minus E2, and so on, and do a distribution. When we, th when we have a full random matrix, now a matrix filled with random numbers, such as those that Wigner used to describe statistically the spectra of heavy nuclei, we get curves like this one, the red one, which is known as Wigner-Dyson distribution. So what does it tell us? That there is no spacing S very close to zero. So we don't have the genesis. Now we have level repulsion. Uh, the eigenvalues are pretty much correlated, the spectrum is rigid. So it's a very simple idea that is incredibly, uh, it works so well. No? So this is data from a real system, it's data from a heavy nucleus, and you see it following the Wigner Dyson distribution. So, so this was a discussion about level statistics in many body uh, systems uh, that goes back to the 50s. The connection with chaos came later in studies of systems where you have both, you have the classical limit and the quantum domain, such as the studies of uh, billiards. And what people saw there is that when the billiard in the classical limit was chaotic and chaotic here in the sense of positively Lyapunov exponent mixing, then in the quantum domain, you would see a big Dyson distribution. If it was not chaotic, was regular, then you would get, for example, Poisson distribution. So this created this connection between classical chaos and level statistics. So um, what we call quantum chaos are the signatures that you find in the quantum domain that tells us what will happen in the classical limit. And this correspondence is well established for systems with few degrees of freedom, you know, for systems where you have both, you have the, the quantum domain and also uh, uh, the classical analysis, the classical analysis of chaos, phase space, and so on. When we move to many body quantum systems, then things become more complicated because it gets more complicated to do the semi-classical analysis. So what we do there usually is just to say, well, if you see a big Dyson distribution, I'll say the system is chaotic. And this is the approach that will be taken in this talk. 
okay? If I see that, I'll tell you this is a quantum system that is chaotic. Let's pick examples now. So let's look at a spin half system in 1D. This Hamiltonian here, where we have just couplings between nearest neighbors, now is the XXZ model. This one is integrable, it's solved with the base answers, but there are many ways that we can bring it to the chaotic domain, can get a good Vignard dice. For example, if we add couplings between second neighbors, so this global perturbation will give us chaos. Or if we add on-site disorder, no? so this is the Hamiltonian that is much used for many body localization. Why uh, localization this scenario becomes so complicated? Because of this interplay between interaction and disorder that brings the system into the chaotic domain. But what is the source of chaos in these many body systems? Interaction, interaction between the particles. So um, you don't really need global perturbations for the system to become chaotic. What we saw for this XXZ model is if we add a single defect, you know, so you have a single site with a Zeeman splitting that is different from the others, this is enough to bring the system to the chaotic domain. The only thing that you have to be careful, you cannot put this defect at the edges if your chain is open, but anywhere else, you're going to get a good big Dyson distribution. What is nice or interesting about this work, uh, this system, uh, uh, since it's chaotic, of course, it's going to thermalize, but what is nice is the analysis of the dynamics and the transport behavior. What has been shown in this work is that even though the system is chaotic, chaotic in the sense that I'm saying no level statistics, it doesn't show diffusive transport. It actually shows ballistic transport. So that's interesting. What we've done recently in this work that uh, we call it the spec of chaos is to show that this way to break uh, integrability, uh, to bring the system into the chaotic domain with a single defect is not exclusive to the XXZ model. There is nothing that's special about the, the XXZ model. Even if we pick the easing model, uh, the easing model in a transverse field, which is a super simple model, you don't need beta answers to solve this one. And you put your little defect there, the system also becomes chaotic. And we also did a study for a spin one model, where spin one is interesting for studies of transport again. Uh, and this single defect brings the system to the chaotic domain. All right. So, if I get a Vigna Dyson distribution, then am I sure that I have a chaotic system? Well, I would say yes, if the Vigna Dyson distribution is robust. What do I mean by that? You can construct an integrable Hamiltonian that will show a Vigna Dyson distribution. This has been done. But the issue there is that if you change the parameter of the Hamiltonian a little bit, you lose it. So it's not robust. You can also have a Vigna Dyson distribution in systems such as the 1D Anderson model. Yeah, this is the 1D Anderson model without interaction. When, if the system size is small, it's smaller than the localization length, but again, it's not robust, you increase the system size and you lose that. And so in this sense, I'm saying, if it is robust, then you will have, um, you can say your system is chaotic. Here, I'm showing the, the, all those models that I said with a single defect. In this case, yes, um, uh, we are saying that these systems are chaotic and it's not just a finite size effect. Um, what I'm showing these plots is this beta here. This is a number that will tell me how close I am to a big dice. You know, so when beta is close to one, here I have a good big dice. So pick, for example, the easy model with the single defect. As I increase the system size, I, should I remove this? Yeah. So as I increase the system size from 12 to 14 to 16, you see that the range uh, of uh, amplitude of this defect, where I have a Vigna Dyson distribution increases. So this is real, now this is case. Uh, you see that as I increase the system size, I can actually decrease that local tiny perturbation. All right, um, how about the, oops, how about the Poisson distribution? If I get a Poisson distribution, then am I um, sure that my system is integrable? Or if I have an integrable system, should I always get a Poisson distribution? Here you should be more careful. If you have a chaotic system and you don't separate the eigenvalues by symmetries, 
if you mix eigenvalues from different symmetries, well, eigenvalues from different subspaces, they are uncorrelated. So you're likely to get a Poisson distribution. On the other hand, if you have an integrable model, you're not going to necessarily get a Poisson distribution. You may have a model with an excessive number of degeneracies, then you're going to have a peak. You may also have a model, an integrable model, where the spectrum is pretty much uniform. That's what people call peak fence kind of spectrum. And there you can get funny shapes. The extreme case of this is like the harmonic oscillator. The harmonic oscillator, the eigenvalues are extremely correlated. And the spacing is, is the same. So it's more correlated than what you have in a random matrix. OK, okay so just one more thing about uh, level statistics. Um, level spacing distribution or the ratio of consecutive spaces now which became popular because you don't need to do the unfolding for those who don't like unfolding uh, these things they detect short range correlations if you want a more complete analysis of your spectrum you should lo look also at quantities that detect long range correlations like the level number variance and this is the variance of your levels in, in, in a certain length L of the spectrum. So as this length increases, the variance grows, but if you're playing with random matrices, it grows slowly, it follows this logarithm because the levels are correlated. If the levels are uncorrelated, it will go um, linearly. And why I'm saying that? Well, here I have a, a plot, plots no? for this model, which is chaotic, which has couplings between second neighbors. That's what uh, brings this model to the chaotic domain. So this T prime is the strength of the, these couplings. And you see when T prime is 0.16 or even 0.08, you get already good big Dyson. But if you go and look at the level number variance, well, 0.08 is here, 0.16 is here. So the spectrum is not that rigid yet. It's not that close to random matrices. Okay, so this is a detail. So this is the story of level spacing, no, level statistics. Let's move now to eigenstates. And I'm going to do, so can eigenstates detect chaos? And uh, what I'm going to do here is the same thing I did before. Let me start thinking about random matrices. I'm, go, I'm always going to use the random matrices as my reference of the scenario where I have the, this extreme um, case of uh, chaos. No? So if I look at the eigenstates of random matrices, all of the eigenstates are just random vectors. No? So huge superposition where all of these coefficients are just random numbers. So there are quantities that we use to measure how spread out a state is. One of them is what we call participation ratio. No? So one over the sum of these components of these coefficients to the fourth. So here I'm showing the participation ratio for all of the eigenstates. Each point is one eigenstate from a random matrix. And you see flat, meaning all states are equivalent, all states are random vectors. Now the participation ratio is very large, proportional to D, D is the dimension of the Hilbert space. What comes in the denominator here depends on the random matrix that you have. Three, if it's real and symmetric, two, if it's GUE. But you see, all states are equivalent, spread. Now let's move to a realistic system. If we move to a realistic system, then the story of bases become important. Uh, in which bases are we going to do this analysis? What the quantum chaos community would tell you? Well, pick the mean field basis. Well, it's not always trivial to identify what is this mean field basis in these many body quantum systems. What we have been doing in spin systems is to pick that whole part of couplings between nearest neighbors, the XXZ mode, which is integral. And, uh, say that this is our mean field, and then let's do the analysis of the whole Hamiltonian, of the eigenstates of the whole Hamiltonian. What are you going to find? Well, first important thing, there is this dependence on the energy. States at the edges of the spectrum of realistic systems, they are not chaotic. Now you don't have chaos at the edges. So you have to move away from the edges, closer to the middle where the spectrum becomes very dense. There, yes, your states will be pretty much spread out, delocalized, large participation ratio, close to random vectors, but not there yet. Uh, there is always some level of correlation in realistic systems. When we are doing analysis of eigenstates, participation ratio, channel entropy is not the only thing that we do. We do a more careful analysis of each one of the states. So what I'm showing here is 
have a chaotic model becomes chaotic due this, to this part, this lambda here. So I'm going to pick one individual eigenstates close to the middle of the spectrum and look at those components. As I increase this perturbation, uh, you will see that my state, so this is small perturbation, as I increase the perturbation, the state is becoming more and more complicated, more, more complex, until I get a distribution that looks very much like a Gaussian. So where the state is getting close to those random vectors. If you want to avoid this discussion about mean field, an alternative would be, well, you can study entanglement entropy. And that's what Page did. And now Marcus has a sequence of very, Marcus and, and Leonard, they have a sequence of very nice works about this. All of these different things I'm mentioning here, entanglement entropy, the structure of the states, uh, participation ratio. What are we doing with them? We are trying to find out how complicated these states are, how close to um, random vectors we are. Now, how close to those states from random matrices our um, realistic systems um, are. There is a different analysis that is not related to what I'm talking about here, but I, I want to mention because it's in one of these talks from this, this sequence, which is what um, the talk by Anatoly. No? So it's a work by Anatoly and Dries, which is very nice, but it's different from what I'm talking here. What they've done was to find a way to measure how sensitive an eigenstate is to a tiny perturbation. Okay, so it's a different story, but it's also interesting. Here, what we are doing is how complicated these states are. Another way to avoid this discussion about basis, well, you could look at the structure of the initial state, and now we are changing the perspective and start thinking about dynamics. If we look at initial state, then the basis is well defined, is the energy eigenbasis. So let's suppose I have a Hamiltonian. Let me pick an initial state, which is an eigenstate of the unperturbed part of this Hamiltonian. This total Hamiltonian, when the perturbation is large, this total Hamiltonian will be chaotic. No, so um, correlated eigenvalues, eigenstates that are chaotic. Let me pick an initial state that has energy away from the edges away from the edges, so to guarantee that I'm in the chaotic region. And let's see what happens as I increase this perturbation. So let me look at the structure of this initial state as I increase this perturbation. Now, in other words, as I put this initial state further and further from any of those um, energy eigenstates. As I increase the perturbation, my initial state will get more and more complex. You see, I go from delta to uh, Lorentzian to a Gaussian. Yeah? And um, so this, this analysis here of the energy distribution, so this is the energy distribution of the initial state. This is important, right? it's detecting this transition to chaos. And it's, um, this is an entity, this um, energy distribution of an initial state, we usually call it LDOS, local density of states. It's very important in studies of dynamics. And you will see this coming uh, later when I talk about dynamics. But up to now, what are we are talking about? Correlated eigenvalues, um, uncorrelated eigenstates, uh, uh, strong perturbation. All this is taking us to the subject of thermalization. All this will guarantee that uh, my observable, my field value observable will thermalize. How? Uh, what guarantees that this quantity will thermalize? First thing, we need to be sure. So this is the equation that describes the, the evolution of my field body observed. Yeah? First thing that I want to be sure is that this term that is just controlling dynamics will average out. So, so I want it to average out, which will guarantee that my observer will have equilibrate. Well, if I have correlated eigenvalues, so level repulsion, I don't have the genders. Well, this is good here. This will help me averaging out. If I have chaotic states, well, these off diagonal elements of my observer will be very small. If I have a, a system that is perturbed far from equilibrium, I'm away from the edges, well, the components of my initial state will be very small, will be uncorrelated. So all that contributes for this term to average out. So it will average out and then we'll have just fluctuations around this second term. No, so we, the, the observable equilibrated is now oscillating around this second term. What happens to this second term? This is the infinite time average. So the second question is, does it agree with a thermodynamic average? 
if it does, well, the question is actually, is it close to a thermodynamic average? Does it get closer and closer as I increase the system size? So if this is true, we say that the system has thermalized. What ETH would tell us, well, if this expectation value, no, so all of alpha is this. No? So if this expectation value of the observable does not fluctuate much, as I go from one eigenstate or another eigenstate, then a single one, I can take it out of this sum, no? a single one will already agree with the average. Here we have a microcanonical average. So that's what ETH will tell us. No? But the question is still there. When will this happen? And you see that K is will guarantee that this will happen because if I have chaotic states, well, of course, if I compute this expectation value with a state that is so close to a random vector, it doesn't matter which random vector I pick, the results will be very similar. And so you see that K is this, um, this mechanism for thermalization. K is guarantees the thermalization will happen that ETH is valid, okay? Now, in the analysis of uh, thermalization, we usually look at these um, diagonal elements of the observables, and you may have seen these plots before. This is a plot for an observable. For that single defect model, you see it gets squeezed together. But if you go to an integrable model, large fluctuations. No? So probably you've seen this before. But we also do, in addition to the analysis of diagonal elements, the analysis of off diagonal elements. And this is what I want to talk a little bit more with you. So Masood has a work where they study these off diagonal elements and they say if the system, the observer thermalizes, uh, these off diagonal elements follow a Gaussian distribution. And no way to determine if you have a Gaussian distribution or not is by looking at this ratio. So what is this ratio? The average of the square of these elements divided by the square of the average. If you have a Gaussian distribution, this ratio is pi over two. Okay, if you pick chaotic systems, I'm showing again the example of the single defect models, you will see a flat, a flat curve very close to that pi over two. And as you increase the system size, so for example, here we have 14 sides in, in gray and uh, 20 in red, as you increase the system size, you see this flat curve becoming longer. Okay, so all that, uh, indicating we have a chaotic system. If you go to the integrable case, you get something completely different. It's not at pi over two, you get a peak, no? completely different. But I want to tell you more than that. What is nice about this off diagonal elements? Well, again, if you don't like unfolding, that's uh, the way to go because you won't need to do any unfolding. But more than that, these quantities, no, these off diagonal elements detect chaos, even if you don't separate the states by symmetries. That's what we saw in the, the work, the spec of chaos. What I'm showing here is two chaotic systems, okay? Two chaotic systems, but we didn't separate the states by symmetries. And then we looked at uh, that ratio, and then you get this flat curve again. So indicating, suggesting that we have chaos, but we're not getting pi over two. We get a multiple of pi over two. So the multiple, the number that you get that multiplies the pi over two will depend on the number of symmetries that you have in the system. So this is nice, you see, because uh, this is telling us that these off diagonal elements, they are not just detectors of chaos. They are also detector of symmetries. Identifying the symmetries in a um, many body in a complex system is not always trivial. Okay, so if I had looked, and we did look no, at the level space and distribution for these two cases, we get false one. But when I look at this ratio, I see, okay, no, the, it is chaotic, I just missed the symmetries. Okay. All right, so up to now, I only talked about indicators associated with static properties. Uh, eigenvalues, eigenstates, diagonal, off diagonal elements of um, an observable. How about dynamics? Uh, is there any kind of manifestation of case that we would find in the dynamics? Now, this is a very important question because level statistics, which is so good to detect case, well, it works well if you have access to this spectrum. That's when we are dealing in nuclear physics. But if you don't, 
Now think about the experiments with cold atoms or ion traps. They look at dynamics. So is there any way to detect chaos in the dynamics? This question will bring us to the story of the out of time order correlator, which is so popular now. But even before the out of time order correlator, back in the 90s, there were many studies about the Loschmidt echo. And the discussion there was, well, if it shows an exponential growth, this indicates a chaotic system. So this was studied, especially by people in NMR, you know, Pastavsky, David Corey, because that's what they measured, and also in, in, the, in the chaos community. Now we have, we have this discussion coming back, now in the form of the out of time order correlated, again, a four point correlated, and the discussion is exponential behavior is an indication of chaos. We are even calling that great, the quantum Lyapunov exponent. Okay, so again, if I have a system with few degrees of freedom, it has been shown that that rate, the rate of uh, growth, the exponential growth of the autoc, does coincide with the classical Lyapunov exponent. So this is a very nice result. Now it was shown by Galitsky with the kick rotor. Then they showed also for billiards. The group by Jorge Hirsch did that for the DK model. So the DK model is this um, spin photon system that is used to study super radiance that has a chaotic region. And there, yes, you see this exponential growth and this rate coincides with the classical Lyapunov exponent. Very nice. What happens when you go to many body quantum systems? The issue is again, how are we going to do the semi-classical analysis? So there are many studies about the autoc for many body systems, but the classical part uh, is not always there because it's so complicated. There are many, many studies. I'm just going to tell you about my work with Borgonov and Israel. Okay. So what did we do there was to study the participation ratio, but not the participation ratio that I mentioned to you before. Participation ratio that I mentioned to you before is just a number associated with the eigenstates. What we did here was prepare the system in a many body state and let it evolve. And so as time goes, this state will be visiting other many body states in this uh, exponentially large Hilbert space gradually. And uh, well, the probability, so let me show to you the quantity that we are measuring. We are measuring this thing that is the participation ratio as well, which is one over the sum of the square of the probability to find my initial state in any other of these many body states. Okay, so this is the participation ratio that we are computing. It's, so it's measuring how this initial state is spread, spreading in the, in the Hilbert space. What do we get for the chaotic system, strong perturbation? We do get an exponential behavior. This gamma that you see here is the width of the energy distribution of the initial state of the LDOS. Remember I said before, the LDOS is uh, important in analysis of dynamics. And here you see it showing up. This width gives us this rate. Twice the width is this rate of this exponential growth. So we did that for this Hamiltonian. So this plot is for this Hamiltonian. And we also did that for spin systems. Let me tell you what this Hamiltonian is. So we have here two body term where these are random numbers. The one body term, these are also random numbers. This Hamiltonian is known as two body random ensemble. Now this is part of these attempts to improve over random matrices. Random matrix completely field, uh, it's not physical. So Wigner himself created what is known as Wigner band random matrix. No? And as things progressed, uh, people finally reach this two body random ensemble. Everybody, well, almost everybody in the quantum case has been studied this, this Hamiltonian since the 70s. This is now um, called SYK model uh, by, by some groups. Okay? So we did that for the two body random ensemble, also for spin systems. But, and then what is the connection with um, our talk? Look, if we uh, pick this, operators. Now, and if I associate V and W with projection operators, each one of these, let's call them what, many body kind of autoc, now, each one of them, now, these are global things, not local Vs and W, these are projections, but each one of them is one of those probabilities. And we started 
the short time dynamics of each one of them, each one of these projections. Then, and we get power law behaviors. The exponent depends on which projection we picked. Power law, but the nice thing is when we add them all, then we recover that exponential behavior. Okay, so that's the connection with um, out of time order correlated in this sense. But then I have a question for you. Now, all this is very interesting, but is the out of time order correlated a real detector of chaos? This is was, was the discussion that we started with a hot Hitchens group. And where did this come from? Now, our uh, discussion. There are classical systems that have a positive Lyapunov exponent, but which are not chaotic. Typical example, I think one of the best examples is the pendulum, the simple pendulum. If we invert it, what is going to happen is this inverted position is unstable. And the positive Lyapunov, um, the, uh, the exp uh, Lyapunov exponent he is positive as you would have for a chaotic system. But of course, uh, this simple pendulum is not integral. Oh, it's not chaotic, it's an integrable model. No? So what is missing in this story? Missing in this story is mixing. No? So you can have positive Lyapunov exponent even if your system is not chaotic. So when we started discussing that, we said, well, wait a second. So let's go back to the uh, DK model. And now let's look at the DK model in the regular regime. Not, it has both, it has a chaotic region and a regular regime. Let's look at it in the regular regime. And let's look at the R talk at the critical point. And what do we see there? Exponential growth. Where this exponent here coincides with the classical Lyapunov exponent, which is not telling us about chaos, it's just telling us about uh, instability. And I said, wow, so then let's pick a completely integrable model like the Lipke model, again, at the critical point. And what do we see there? From, again, exponential growth. Again, this lambda here is the classical Lyapunov exponent, which is not detecting chaos, is detecting instability. And so this is interesting. And uh, this was a thing that was going on in parallel, uh, different groups, I think, had the same idea at the same time. No? First, we saw a hint for that in a work by Fazio. Then there was a work by uh, Klaus Richter, very general, about this, the critical point. Then there is also work by Kao and uh, a new work by Hashimoto, all saying that our talk does not necessarily detect chaos, it detects instability. So the question is still there. Uh, is there any way to detect chaos in that um, um, traditional sense that I was talking before, no? in the sense of correlated eigenvalues? Is there any kind of manifestation of spectral correlations in the dynamics? So, so the analysis of out of time order correlators at short times. To detect spectral correlations, you have to wait longer. No? We need to give time for the dynamics to resolve the discreteness of this spectrum. If you give it time, and if the spectrum is correlated, the eigenvalues are correlated, you will see that in the form of what is known as correlation hole. So what is the correlation hole? Uh, let's look at this quantity, the survival probability or return probability. Yeah? So it's the probability for finding the initial state later in time. So I can write this as a sum of the components of the initial state with these phases. Can also write this sum as an integral. So this row here is the sum of these delta functions. So this row here is an energy distribution weighted by those components of the initial state. So this is the energy distribution that we talked before you know, that I said is important in analysis of dynamics is what we call LDOS. So you see survival probability is the square of the Fourier transform of this, of this um, LDOS. The shape of the LDOS, the bounds of this uh, spectrum, will control the dynamics at short times. But if you give enough time for the dynamics, it will finally realize that you don't have here a continuous spectrum. Uh, that not, it's not only the shape, the envelope that matters, it matters also what is inside because this spectrum is discrete. And if these eigenvalues are correlated, you will see that showing up in the dynamics with this, this in this form, which is this deep, this hole. So coming back to the equation of survival probability, this is the infinite time average. 
which is this dashed line. If the eigenvalues are correlated, you get even below that. So this is the correlation point. Shows up at long times. So this, all this uh, short time um, behavior depends on the shape of the distribution, the bounds, but at long times, if the eigenvalues are correlated, it shows up. This correlation hole is what is called now in some works, especially in high energy physics, they call it ramp because yeah, you have a ramp here going up to saturation. So the correlation hole was first proposed um, in studies of molecules. The problem with uh, that was back in the eighties. Some chemists also um, discussing that because the issue with molecules is that uh, you don't have very good line resolution as you have in, in, in nuclei. So this was a way, okay, can we detect uh, level repulsion for our molecules? And the correlation hole was the idea. Okay, so if you pick any kind of chaotic system, like those single defect models that I told you before, you will see the hole showing up everywhere. And this hole will show up with the same form, with the same shape that you find uh, when you're dealing with full random matrix. So, what is nice about the correlation hole? First is the dynamical manifestation of case, no? important for some experiments. Other features, well, you don't need unfolding again for those who hate unfolding. Unfolding is not such a big deal. But uh, what is also nice, just as those um, um, off diagonal elements of observables, it doesn't care about symmetries. The hole will develop even if your initial state is visiting um, states from different symmetry sectors, okay? So it doesn't care about symmetry. So just as those off diagonal elements, this is nice, not just as an indicator of case, but also as a way to detect symmetries. As I said, it's not always trivial to find all the symmetries in our system. Issues that we could have, or that, you, that uh, people might object um, with, uh, with respect to the correlation hole. First thing, well, if you look here, we are reaching tiny, tiny values. No? So how can we expect an experimentalist to go all the way there to have such high precision? Well, if you stay looking at uh, chains that are not too large, well, the values are not that small and the times are not that long. Another issue, survival probability. Do I have a question? I have yes. Oh, go on, so. the, uh, is the random matrix theory expectation for the correlation hole known analytically? Yes, I'm going to say about this. Yeah, okay. and I'm going to give you the, the expression, go on. Okay, and there's one additional question about the part about the OTOC that it's not a question, but rather a comment that apparently the long time analysis of the OTOC does detect chaos. Maybe that's something you could comment on. Yeah, long time, yeah, the, well, long time. Uh, Again, long time will show will detect the correlations. No, so long times will detect something like a correlation hole. It's a the survival probability is a two point uh, uh, correlator. The um, all talk is a four point, but it will also um, develop a, a correlation hole. Okay. So I'll come back to the analytical expression of the hole um, some slides ahead. Any other yeah. question? I continue. Yes, there's one more question from okay. John Gould. Also congratulating you on the brilliant talk that the time scale for the correlation hole to the finish seems strongly operator dependent. Is there some understanding on how the time scale depends on the support of the operator? Yeah, they, okay. I'm going also to, well, the, the, the story is you have to give time for the dynamics to, um, so it, it has to resolve the, the, the discreteness of the spec. So this will depend on the system size. Uh, the question that uh, John is asking about observables, look, and that's uh, connected with what I was going to say now, survival probability is a global quantity. So do we see hole also in observables? We do see holes also in observables at the same time scales of the survival probability because uh, you, you see it's the detection of the, it, it, this is depending now on eigenvalues only, not on the short time dynamics. It's once you resolve the discreteness, the whole um, uh, appears and develops. We saw that in another quantity, which is a local quantity, which is the spin autocorrelation function. So this is equivalent to the density imbalance that is seen, uh, that is studied in cold atoms. We did not see the whole in all local observables in some of them. So here you have one example and it shows up 
and the same time scale of the survival probably. Ah, I don't have the plots. No, I don't have the, the, the plot for this Hamiltonian here for the survival probability. I have it later, but try to keep in your mind. Okay, so you see the correlation hole for the spin auto correlation here around 100 for 12 sites. You will see it around 100 again for the survival probability. Okay, so it shows at the same time scale. What changes is as you increase the system size, yes, then the hole will show up a longer time because uh, the mean level spacing is decreasing as you increase the system size. Is there any other question? Um, there's one more question about OTOX, but that's, that's probably better for the end of the talk. For the end? Okay. Go. Okay, so then let me continue about this discussion. Is uh, the whole a, a good way to detect case? There is another ob objection here, which is the story about self-averaging behavior. The, um, the region of the correlation hole and the two level form factor is non-self-averaging. This has been discussed before. In fact, what we showed in this work and this we showed analytically using random matrices the entire survival probability is not self-averaging at any time scale. So what does self-averaging mean? Now, so how do you determine if a quantity is self-averaging or not? You look at this ratio. Now, so it's the, the variance of your observable, the variance for the fluctuations divided by the, the square of the mean. So if the quantity is self-averaging, this ratio will decrease as your system size increases. In other words, as you increase the system size, if you are dealing with a, a disordered system, such as uh, this example here, this is on-site disorder, as you increase the system size, you can decrease the number of disorder realizations. So that's convenient. And more important, uh, as you go into the thermodynamic limit, a single realization is enough. So your properties, the properties that you analyze, do not depend on the specific realization that you select. So this is a very important property in this order system. What we saw is that the survival probability at any time scale is not self-averaging. This ratio is what we're showing here for the survival probability evolved on the full random matrices. As I increase the dimension of the matrix, you see the R is increasing at short times. So for sure not self-averaging. At long times, it is a constant. So for sure not self-averaging. What does that mean? Well, you will need to keep doing big averages, even if you go to large size, okay? In this work, we did analysis of uh, self-average of different quantities, different time scales, and, and this is something new. Now, analysis of self-average is usually done at equilibrium. We are studying the whole time scale. So what is the drawback here? You will have to do averages. If you're dealing with a disorder system, you will do averages anyway over disorder realizations. If you don't have a disorder season, well, do your averages over initial states and you will see the whole. If you don't want to do averages over initial states, do running averages and you will see the whole, okay? So there are different alternatives there. You, saw, you heard me talking about two level form factor. So what is the connection between survival probability and two level form factor? So this is uh, the equation for the survival probability. You know? So this is the infinite time average that we mentioned before. I'm indicating this with this bar. This is the part that controls the dynamics. Uh, I can write this sum as an integral. Um, if I have chaotic system, strong perturbation, well, this component and the eigenvalues are statistically independent. That's why I'm separating them. And if you want to go through all these details of these um, derivations, have a look at the appendix of this work. What I'm trying to get into here is I'm going to reach a point where I'm just going to be looking at the eigenvalues, okay, at this delta function. Inside this, we have two contributions. One is the one-point correlation function, which is just the density of states. The density of states depend on the system that you're dealing with. Random matrices gives you a semicircle. Realistic many body systems, we have Gaussian. Okay. So this is the part that controls your evolution at short times. What else do we have here? Well, correlations. Yeah? So the correlations uh, are sh show up in this uh, function that is called the two level cluster function. And now I'm coming back to a question that was asked. Yeah? The Fourier transform of this is this function here. And this is an analytical result 
go to Meta's book about random matrices and you will see there this. This Fourier transform is what is known as two-level form factor. And so it, it has been obtained analytically for GOE, for GUE. And so it's all there in Meta's book. It's an excellent book. Now, this is an analysis of uh, level statistics in the time domain. There is no discussion here about really um, dynamics. This is what we are doing. You know? We are really studying the entire evolution. We are after the time scales. This discussion about uh, uh, two level form factor in random matrix was just an analysis of level statistics. Okay? What we are doing is an entire uh, discussion of the dynamics. So we do take into account the density of state. We do take into account the different shapes. We don't do any kind of unfolding in the spectrum. Again, remember, we are trying to think of the poor experimentalists who do not have access to the spectrum. So he cannot do unfolding, he cannot do rescalings or anything like that. So we take into account everything, both contributions. And for the components of the initial state also, we don't put anything by hand here. These components are coming from the quantum dynamics. The experimentalists can prepare this initial state. Okay, so we are going to use the same components for that initial state. So we do this entire um, um, description. Following all those steps, and then again, as I said, look at the appendix of our work, we obtain analytical expressions for the survival probability evolved under full random matrices, evolved under realistic uh, many body systems with two body couples. This expression here for full random matrix is shown in red in this plot. Black is the numerics, excellent agreement, yeah? Here, uh, this analytical expression is shown with this dark line and um, red is the numerics. Again, excellent agreement. And I repeat, it's excellent. This is log log. Okay, so we are getting tiny values here, very, very long time. So it's very good. This expression is very general to many body interacting, strongly interact many body systems. We also have an, an analytical expression for the DK model, which was obtained with uh, Jorge Hirsch's group. Once we have these analytical expressions, great, we can get um, the time scales analytically. The first important time scale here is that gamma again, no? uh, the gamma, which is the width of the LDOS that I mentioned before. One of our gamma tells us uh, this um, first of very fast spread of our initial state. Later, because of the bounds, we are going to follow this power law behavior which will finally take us to the minimum of the whole. Using this expression, we get an analytical result for um, the time to reach the minimum of the whole and the time to finally saturate. So this is the expression, this is the time to reach the minimum of the whole for random matrices. For random matrices, just a constant. Yeah? Because in random matrices, the initial state is coupled with everything else. The matrix is completely filled. So it doesn't care about the size of the system the time to reach the minimum of the whole is the same for any random matrix, it doesn't matter the size. For realistic system, the story is different. You know? So that is a bit connected with, I think, what John had asked. As I increase the system size, this time grows exponentially. Why? Well, because I started with a many body state that has ahead of it an exponentially large Hilbert space, which grows as the system size increases. But to visit all of those states, it goes step by step. Now you can only count one with those uh, local uh, two body couplings. So it takes an exponentially long time. And so that's the, the issue with uh, the correlation hole, it takes time for it to show up. And then finally, it will saturate. Again, from those analytical expressions, we can get this time. This expression is here, this time, is just the inverse of the mean level space. It's the largest possible time scale in the system. It's what people call Heisenberg time. But it's nice again that it came from our analytical expression. So here in red, the time to reach the minimum of the whole, dots comes from the numerics, dash line, the Heisenberg time, which came from our analytical expression, agreed uh, with numerics. How am I doing with time? You've been speaking for 50 minutes now. 15? Okay. Uh, oh, okay. 
So, uh, okay, so now, now I think I will conclude soon. Then. So uh, this analysis that we've done for the survival probability in the chaotic regime was for, um, uh, sir, okay, so it was analytical. Huh? We also did an analysis for observables, but then it was numerical. And we also studied survival probability and observables as we move away from the chaotic region. Okay, so if you pick this Hamiltonian, which is used in studies of many body um, localization, as we increase the disorder, we are going to start moving away from the chaotic region until we reach localization. As we move away from the chaotic region, as this disorder strength grows, you start killing the correlations of the eigenvalues. What happens to the whole, it gets postponed to longer times. And we see that this time to reach the minimum of the whole grows exponentially with the disorder. All this was done for survival probability and observables, but numerically. This brings me to the conclusion because what we are trying to do, and I think now we, we, we have well advanced with Jonathan, is to try to get analytical expressions also here when we, are, we get away from chaos. Okay, so this is one of our goals and this is something we are doing with John. The other thing is trying to get analytical results for other observables, not just survival probability. And now both in the chaotic region and uh, away from chaos. We have some studies of that where we use the survival probability as our support, but I want to do more than that. I want to be able to give to you a plot like this, you know, log log plot with excellent agreement between analytical expression and numerics. Okay, so this is something else that we are doing. But message for this part of the, the talk, you know, this non-equilibrium many body quantum dynamics. We've been using random matrices as our reference because we can get analytical results as Vigna already knew so well. You know? Just random vectors, correlated eigenvalues, we can get analytical results. Once we get that, we have this general picture. Then we try to go on step beyond, trying to get analytical results for a realistic model. And that's what we did for the survival probability. Now, but as, you, as I said, we want to go even beyond that. Um, what else? Some messages from the beginning of the talk, now, when I was talking about that tiny single defect um, perturbation, the local perturbation. This local perturbation, seems to be enough to bring the system to the chaotic domain. And what becomes interesting in this kind of systems is um, the, the transport behavior as you saw in that work by John Gould and, and Marcus Rigon. Né? What else is in that discussion, in the discussion of the spec of chaos? Well, talked a lot about the correlation hole. It's a good indicator of chaos because it's dynamic, so good for experiments. No need unfolding. You don't care about symmetries, just as happens with the off-diagonal elements. So they are good ways to detect chaos, but again, I emphasize it's more than that. You know, they are good tools to identify symmetries. Symmetries is not so easy to detect. And another advantage, now, we can use them to try to search for new integrable models. How integrable models are, are, are uh, created, no? integrable Hamiltonians. So they are built, they're constructed using like Young-Baxter equation. Using tools like that, maybe that will give us more freedom. Anyway, so I already talked way too much and I think there are questions. So thank you all for your attention. Thanks a lot for this excellent overview of indicators of chaos and symmetry. It was very engaging. I really enjoyed it. So I think the first question I have is a comment, um, a question that was asked during the talk about OTOX, saying that there are works analyzing the long time fluctuations of the OTOX, which show that the chaos can be detected directly in the OTOX. Ah, okay. So, so the person is not talking about the whole, right? He's talking about the saturation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is true. There are, there are, there are many studies and this is nice. Again, Okay, so this is a good thing. There are uh, nice studies about the saturation. What I have seen, and there are some works by um, one of my collaborators, no, um, uh, Kuro Perez Bernal, where what they are showing is that that saturation point, again, is a good way to detect critical points. No? So uh, yeah, so that's a comment. I don't know, maybe the person wants to say more okay. to that. Um, then there's one more comment and a question. 
first by Diego Lisniaki saying that the inverse harmonic oscillator has zero Lyapunov exponent and claiming that you are confusing the Lyapunov exponent with local instabilities. With local, inst okay. with local that instability. The inverted pendulum has a positive Lyapunov exponent. Well, the Lipkin model has a positive Lyapunov exponent at the critical point. The DK model has a positive Lyapunov exponent in the critical point, the regular. And there were other studies, no? the, the Hashimoto, all these people have studies. The, the point of the, that, the, that discussion was you can have an exponential growth of the all talk uh, with an exponent that coincides with a classical kind of Lyapunov exponent which is not indicating case, it's just indicating stability. But uh, I can talk to Diego. Diego, talk to me, send me a message. <laughs> I don't know. Sure, then uh, next question is, can I think of the page value itself as a dynamical indicator of whether the system is chaotic or not? Oh, oh what, the page? Can, page? can I think of page value itself as a dynamical indicator? The, the, for the entanglement entropy? I think, it, I think he's referring to that, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. But of course, I, uh, that's a, a good indicator that your states are chaotic states. Yeah, just uh, that discussion, that's uh, Marcus' work no? and, and Leo's work. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's indicating what Page did was again, uh, random vectors, starting with random vectors. So the analysis of entanglement entry is how close we get to that point. Then the next question by Diego is, what is the manifestation of the whole in the long time behavior of the OTOC? Ah, okay. So if you just look at the um, eigenvalues of the OTOC, you should get a correlation hole there. We saw that, okay, we saw that correlation hole with Garcia Garcia. It's in that uh, work from 2018. There is a hole there also, but the issue for us was that, um, well, the OTOC is more complicated to compute and there was no self averaging. Yeah, so it was hard to see the whole there, but it's there. It's a, instead of a two point uh, uh, correlator, you have a four point correlator. The eigenvalues will manifest, the correlation between the eigenvalues will show up also in the whole. Maybe maybe you can do that and, uh, and show them. Yeah, but we saw it there also. Okay, thanks a lot. And there's a next question from John Gould connected to his previous question. These timescales you get from the survival probability, but could you change the quench protocol? Is there something to be learned there? No, of course, no, of course, this is super nice. No, of course, you see, uh, what I did was to pick a strong perturbation, an initial state with energy close to the middle of the spectrum. So um, as close as I could uh, to make this uh, dynamics fast, uh, close to uh, random matrix and so on. If you move away from the middle of the spectrum, no, if your energy of your initial state is closer to the edge, well, the dynamics will slow down. If your perturbation is small, now I have a perturbation where the energy distribution was Gaussian. If the perturbation is small, so I have a Lorentzian, well, the dynamics will slow down. So there are many things that will make things even worse. No, it will take even longer for the whole to show up. There are many things to, to analyze there. So, okay, uh, I, I was trying to get analytical results, but you have all these questions, dependence on perturbation, dependence on energy, no? so dependence on the observable that you pick, not all observables will develop the correlation hole and uh, uh, deep in the chaotic regime as you're moving away from chaos, yeah, there are lots of things to analyze there. Okay, thanks a lot. There's a lot of people also thanking you in the chat for this excellent talk. Thanks. And there's one more comment by Horatio Pastowski. Uh -huh. I think that the different correlation functions you addressed could be implemented with tailored OTOX, where different OTOX yield different observables. Right, yeah, so that's the story. Now I think now we are calling OTOX everything. But uh, what is that V? What is that W? Yeah. Uh, what are the operators that you're going to use there? Yeah. And uh, for sure, yeah, you could detect that with NMR. NMR is the place to study any kind of auto. You need to go, the dynamics to go and come back. So NMR is the method of choice for that. Okay. Thanks. So I think that concludes this week's seminar. So thanks again to Leah for this excellent talk. Thanks to all of you for watching. But before we go, there's a short public service announcement that will be taking a short two week break with the seminars before we restart with the fall series of the seminars at the beginning of September. 
And you should all get a mail for that. And in case you don't, you can subscribe to the mailing list or subscribe to this YouTube channel. So thanks again for watching and see you later. Thank you all. Bye.